Joining us now on the line from Washington, D.C., Peter W. Singer. He is director of the 21st Century Defense Initiative and senior fellow in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution. And Peter, it's good to have you on the program again. I want to start by actually reading something, an excerpt of a piece you wrote for the New York Times earlier this year, and it goes like this. Just 10 years ago, the idea of using armed robots in war was the stuff of Hollywood fantasy. Today, the United States military has more than 7,000 unmanned aerial systems, popularly called drones. There are 12,000 more on the ground. Last year, they carried out hundreds of strikes, both covert and overt, in six countries, transforming the way our democracy deliberates and engages in what we used to think of as war. Let's just clarify uh, something you said at the end of that excerpt there, and then we'll go from there, because what we used to think of as war meant what in contrast to what we're talking about today? Well, the idea of war used to involve both engaging in combat, but also bearing risk for that combat. That is, um, it, war included both destruction and um, risk to your own people. They went hand in hand. And what's playing out right now is technology is allowing us to disconnect those two, where you can engage in combat, but not have your people go into harm's way. That's obviously a positive from one perspective because um, it means uh, less condolence letters going to soldiers' um, fathers and mothers. Mm -hmm. The trade-off of that, though, is, is changing the way that politicians think about war, or more importantly, the decisions on when and where to go to war. But I'm inferring from that that if the risk is not as high, you presume politicians will get into military adventures uh, more easily or without thinking them through as much? Essentially what we're doing is we're, we're lowering the barriers to what we used to think of as war. Um, and not just the way the politicians think about them, but the way we in the public think about them, and of course the way the media reports them. So, you know, the example of uh, the not-so-covert operation the U.S. is carrying out in Pakistan right now. We've carried out more than 300 of these so-called drone strikes, that is using um, unmanned aerial systems to carry out bombing runs, more than 300 of these. And yet, that's not an operation that's been um, authorized by the Congress. In fact, wasn't even debated by the Congress. The media reports it much differently than it would say the Kosovo War just 10 years ago, which was um, actually much, much smaller in scale than this current operation. So what, what's going on here is um, we're engaging in the combat side, but because we're not having the risk side of the equation, we're not talking about it, we're not thinking about it in the same way. And maybe it is lowering the barriers to war. Certainly, um, you see discussions of it as being costless or some of the adjectives that are used. And the point I'm making here is that no operation, no war, whether it's with sticks and stones or, or predator drones, is never costless. It's complicated. War is something that used to be a weighty thing for a democracy to decide, and yet we're not having the same kind of deliberations right now. Well, let me ask what may seem like a silly question, but in the old days, under the old rules, if country A dropped 300 bombs on country B, you would say country A was at war with country B. Is the United States at war with Pakistan? I don't know if we're at war with Pakistan, but by the old rules, we are at war in Pakistan. Um, that is, we're doing something that we used to think of as war, which is blowing up stuff not just in ones or twos, but a lot of stuff. Um, this is a large-scale operation, again, more than 300. Um, that's about seven times the size of the opening round of the Kosovo War. But I think what's interesting here is um, not just to focus on the so-called covert operations, even though we all talk about them in places like Pakistan or Yemen or um, Somalia, but the real game changer actually happened a couple months back in the overt operation in Libya, where the U.S. Um, essentially was part of the NATO operation there. And after a couple of days, the president said, we're um, stepping back from this. We will no longer be engaging in um, combat operations. Uh, therefore, Congress doesn't need to vote on this. Um, in the U.S., we have a rule called the War Powers Resolution that uh, we can't um, keep military forces in operation uh, for longer than 60 days without congressional authorization. Well, in this case, um, the president, uh, the administration said that um, because we don't have people in harm's way, we don't need that authorization, except we were doing something that used to be thought of as war. 
well past that 60 day mark, actually for about five months, we were blowing stuff up in Libya, um, 146 airstrikes using predators there. So it's this interesting um, disconnect that was happening. While we were saying we didn't need Congress to authorize it because we didn't have people going into harm's way, we were engaging what we used to think of as war. And that's what I'm really making the point here is, um, the irony is I actually support these operations. I'm just not excited about the way we've gone about them. And more importantly, the precedents that we're setting right now Bottom line, we've set a precedent that as long as you don't send people into harm's way, the executive branch can really do what it wants. It doesn't need congressional authorization. And that's a game changer for constitutional democracies. Well, let me just flush you out a little more on that, because on the one hand, while you say you support them, on the other hand, you seem to be saying that because of this new advancement in technology, administrations now and in the future are going to be able to take an end run around Congress and perhaps even the Constitution in the way that America prosecutes future battles. And I don't think I hear you saying you approve of that. Is that right? Context will change. Um, look, there's uh, things that make sense now um, against uh, adversaries that have struck us that I could see a future president um, maybe expanding that. Uh, you know, whereas Libya was a, a situation where we had a, you know, a bad dictator and a potential massacre happening on the ground, we can imagine it being a little bit more controversial if we're looking at other scenarios. Um, what I'm getting at here is that we're setting precedents without thinking about the long-term consequences of them. So that's uh, one part of it. The other part of it is, let's be blunt this technology is not going away. So there's no way to sort of wave our hands in the air and say, well, let's just stop using drones. That's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen for the US. It's not gonna happen for the more than 50 other countries out there, including Canada, that are currently um, building, buying, or using military robotics right now. So the fact of the matter is we're not gonna escape this dilemma. What we have to do is recognize the dilemmas there and start to set up the new structures that will allow us to navigate it. But so far, we're not having that discussion. We're not having that discussion in the media, we're not having it in the public, and we're certainly not having it in the relationship between our legislatures and our executive branches. I don't know how much of Canadian involvement in this you meant to include by putting it on the list you just put it, but uh, are you saying C Canadian military are using drones in their warfare as well? Because we certainly don't hear anything about that up here. Are you saying that, Peter? One of the things I love in, in um, uh, talking with different audiences is there's this idea that this technology is some kind of American-only thing, and, and it links to you know some so-called American love of technology or uh, whatever. And the reality is, whether I'm talking to a German audience or a um, Canadian audience, your militaries are also engaged in the robotics revolution. Now, sometimes they try and um, skirt around it. Uh, so for example, not outright buying the system, but leasing the system. Um, to me, it's sort of, you know, when you ask someone, uh, do you use a car? Saying I don't own a car, but renting a car is still a yes. And that's the same for Canadian forces right now. Well, what and look, I want to know I'm is- I'm not saying that is a- I, I just want to be clear, uh, whether we're owning the car or renting the car is one thing. Are we driving the car? Are Canadian forces using drones and dropping yes, bombs? Yes, Canadian forces. Yes, Canadian forces have both leased these systems for operations um, in places like Afghanistan, much like many of the other um, NATO uh, allies have. Canada is part of NATO, so it's also part of certain structures where there's a pooling of resources. And of course, the Canadian military looking forward is um, looking into all the different aspects of the robotics revolution, like any other military that's worth its salt would be doing right now. Um, I'm not condemning them for it. This is what they should be doing. It is a new technology that more than 50 different countries are engaging in. So the point is not to say, how dare you utilize this technology? The point is that we need to start recognizing that it's real and it presents new challenges and dilemmas that we all have to navigate, not just within the military, not just within the executive branch, but it offers um, certain new uh, seductive elements to where we go to war or not and how 
the policymakers look at it, how the media reports it, that we need to recognize. And that's playing out in the United States right now um, in our operations, whether it's in a Pakistan or a Libya. And of course, it also affects other nations that are going down this same pathway. Okay, fair enough. In which case, how do we make sure that the lawmakers or the decision makers of the future um, have more accountability measures in place, which will satisfy those who believe that there's just a complete lack of accountability in the way these weapons are used today? Frankly, to me, a, a large part of this is um, not accepting uh, the argument that just because you don't have people going into harm's way, that somehow the discussion is off the table. Um, if you are engaging in some use of force, even if there are not people being sent into harm's way, well, in most of our um, democracies, in most of our constitutions, issues of war were not just limited to the executive branch. The legislature had a role in them, whether people were going into harm's way or not. And I, when I look at, for example, the U.S. situation, um, our own Congress has uh, effectively sat on its hands when it comes to these topics. We know that we're engaging in these operations, and yet it hasn't had a debate over them. It hasn't had a vote on them, either to say we authorize it or we're against it. And so part of it is just simply um, stepping up to the issue, uh, recognizing that this technology exists, these kind of operations uh, are ongoing, and that there needs to be a role beyond a limited set of um, executive branch policymakers deciding it. Uh, beyond that, we need to start to recognize that any operations, any use of force has complications that come out of it. Well, Therefore, we need to look at them not just as a tactic, but within an overall strategy. Uh, you talk about unforeseen consequences, and I want to pick up there because I think I read in a recent piece in the New York Times uh, not just the, uh, the notion of the difficulties of the original drone strikes, but that when medical personnel would respond to the drone strikes, th there were American drones that were hitting them, and that there were even circumstances where when there were funerals taking place, um, American drones would be pr presumably inadvertently hitting these people as well. Uh, have these circumstances, in your mind, uh, kicked up the need among legislators in the United States to get some of those harder and faster rules around the use of these things in place? I'm going to give you a, a, probably an opposite response than what you expect from what I said before, but um, those reports uh, that were put out there, I've not seen them confirmed by anywhere. And um, one of the challenges of this discourse surrounding the topic is that um, on one hand, you have uh, operations that are sort of not so covert, as I call them. They're, they're operations that we know are ongoing, but no one um, publicly talks about them. Then you, on the flip side, you have these various reports that come out of this or that bad thing, and this recent one, this claims of targeting funerals and the like. Um, it came from a uh, investigative journalism outfit from London. Um, it's uh, hard to clarify that. There may be some underlying intent that we've seen in the reporting. The basic point that I'm getting at here is that we've got a lot of um, incomplete uh, or false or agenda pushed information on all sides. And that's what happens when you don't have a lot of transparency, when you have these not so covert operations. You feed the beast of conspiracy theory. And that's may maybe what's happening right here. Um, bottom line to me is whenever you use force, what, bad things will happen. We don't know the scale of those bad things. We don't know if these stories are true or not. But you do know that if you're carrying out more than 300 bomb strikes, bad things are invariably going to happen. And so then you need to recognize that there is no operation that is um, costless, which is how one of the, the adjectives is often thrown around in Washington, D.C. to describe these operations, mm -hmm. that when you're using force, there's consequences that come from that. Um, and so we have the example of uh, the fellow who um, plotted to set off a bomb in Times Square in New York City. He got into terrorism inspired in part over his anger from the strikes in Pakistan designed to end terrorism. You get caught in these weird circles. And what I'm getting at here is that, therefore, um, while the technology may be seductive and sort of lowering the bars makes it seem like it's a solution, no technology, even a predator drone, is a silver bullet solution to all your problems. And that's why you need to have the discourse over it. And the discourse can't be something that happens just among a couple quiet people in a room. When you're talking about the use of force on behalf of a nation in a democracy, 
that discourse has to be something that involves both the executive branch and the legislative branch, and that's not happening right now. Your, your reference there to a couple of quiet people in a room, uh, let me pick up on that with what might seem like an odd question, but it, my hunch is people are curious about how this actually works. Who's sitting where pushing what buttons or moving what joysticks that actually sets these things in motion and gets them dropping bombs on people 5,000 miles away. How does that work? Well, I think you, you hit a real um, key part of the distinction in the WHO uh, of what happens when it's a military operation versus an um, intelligence operation. Uh, I don't have a fundamental problem with this technology being used by the military. And that's because the military has a distinct chain of command. Um, the people involved serve in uniform, so they're responsible to a court-martial system if something goes wrong. Um, so in the U.S., for example, in our operations over Afghanistan or Iraq that utilize unmanned systems, the plane may physically be over Afghanistan, but the pilot that's flying it will be located at a base, um, say, in Nevada. And they're part of the military. There is a military lawyer, a JAG officer, who authorizes all of those strikes, much like they would with a man system. So there's not so much um, uh, of a challenge on the legal and ethical side when you're talking about military use. Now, the problem of answering your question of who uh, gets really difficult when you talk about the covert operations, the kind of stuff going on in a Pakistan or in a Somalia. Because there, the who, well, it's never been um, discussed because we don't even acknowledge that these operations happen. Um, it's a civilian intelligence agency that's operating the system. That means there's civilians involved. That means that the people um, providing the legal advice are civilian lawyers, not military. Um, ostensibly, they should be responsible to civilian law, but remember, we're not openly admitting that these operations happen, so if something goes wrong, well, it's a covert operation to begin with. And basically, everything becomes really murky when you talk about the civilian side of using a weapon of war. And that's why um, one of the concerns here by this lack of transparency is that when things go wrong, in the military, you've got a system to hold people accountable. On the covert operations, well, it's um, there used to be this TV commercial uh, with a used car salesman who would say, um, just trust me, that's the same phenomena here. <laughs> I, I want to pick up on one very interesting word that you just used in that last answer because it did sort of raise my eyebrows a bit. You called the person who operates this drone a pilot. And I'm curious as to why they're called pilots, even though they are, say, 5,000 kilometers removed from the actual craft that they're operating. Well, that's one of the big things that's um, changing, uh, is not just the technology that we're using, but how it affects the um, demographics of war, the who can do what. So with the current systems used by mm -hmm. Uh, the U.S. Air Force, for example, they require um, officers, rated pilots, that is someone who's gone through pilot training school to operate them from the ground. They're remotely operating them. Now, the key though is um, whether you're talking about your kid's uh, iPod or you're talking about an armed robotic system, technology always evolves. So whereas the past generation of this technology was um, completely remotely operated from the ground, um, nothing happening without a human decision, we're starting to see new generations that can do more and more on their own, take off and land on their own, fly mission waypoints on their own, do um, target identification on their own. And then with that, it also means that the humans behind them, even 5,000 kilometers away, are having um, different training standards. So for example, uh, with the new generation, you no longer have to be a um, rated pilot to fly them. Uh, there's one um, system, for example, that uh, I remember interviewing an 18-year-old high school dropout who was able to operate it. And that, of course, raises some really interesting questions because we used to, in the military, determine whether someone was qualified based almost exclusively on um, technical measures, their um, skill at airmanship, as it's called in the U.S. Air Force. Now we may want to look more and more into um, not the airmanship side of the equation, 
but things like uh, their experience in the laws of war. Um, going through, uh, we may want someone older involved, not because they can move the, the joystick back and forth quicker, but because they've gone through war college training and the like. What we're getting at is there are some fundamental shifts going on here, not just in the weapon we re use, but also who can use it and where. Gotcha. And this is not even to go into the generation after that that's um, more and more autonomous. And that moves you into some really, really tough legal dilemmas when the system's firing on its own. But we're not there yet. Hmm. The issues today are complicated enough. Let me ask you one last thing, Peter, then, as we wrap up this discussion, and that is presumably drone, drones are used today overwhelmingly for attacking personnel, military personnel, military hardware, uh, depots, uh, you know, facilities, that type of thing. But if these programs are going to be expanding the way you think they will be in the future, can you give us a sense of how the targets may change as we go forward as well? I think the, the best parallel for where robotics is today um, is in the air where the manned airplane was back in um, the middle of World War I. So if you go back to World War I, just a couple years before the war, um, planes were uh, science fiction. They were flying machines. Then they became real. And then someone deployed them into war just to do observation. And then they saw the bad guy and said, hmm, I want to do something about it. And so we jury-rigged arm the early airplanes. And then we specially designed them for all sorts of different roles. Within war, so you had uh, bomber planes. You had fighter planes designed to take on each other in the air. Pretty soon you had planes being used for transportation, medical evacuation. And of course all of that moves over to the civilian sector. Um, and we see planes used for uh, the same sort of roles and um, postal delivery, you name it, by the 1920s. Well, the exact same phenomena is happening with robotics today. They were first science fiction, then they were introduced into war, they were originally just for observation, then they were jury-rigged armed. Now they're being specially designed to be armed in all the different roles and variants that means, from small ones to large ones to bomber to fighter equivalents. To we're also now seeing prototypes used for things like cargo. Um, there's a robotic helicopter being used out in Afghanistan right now to medical evacuation, you name it. And so what's playing out is this widespread proliferation, not just in terms of the roles and functions they might play in war, but also moving over to the civilian side of the economy. And of course, that's happening not on a US only level, but on a global level. And so um, all these issues right now, uh, we're just at the start of this. Uh, we're at the start of considering where these things are going, but we're at the end of our conversation. And Peter, I can't thank you enough for spending so much time with us on the line from Washington, D.C. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.